to the Leighton Sauna Special. <laughs> Let the, the heat soak, soak uh, away your cares. Make room for the, the CS knowledge to come in. Couple uh, 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 note about the Lab 4 check-in post. Uh, your nine came tonight. If you're working with a partner, both partners need to make a post. Um, questions about the lab or any of the, the stuff we've been looking at? No. I said this in my checking post, but if it's just a really short thing, but I just like to remind you. For the macros, like, is there a way to perform them online? Like, yeah, and uh, as is the case in uh, uh, many similar situations, uh, putting a backslash at the end of a line of a macro lets the macro continue on the next line. So you just put that at the end of each line except for the last one, and that lets you split it up across multiple. Other questions? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like a delay though. I'm just wondering, is there like a maximum amount of macros you can have? Is there like a lot of grid? Is there a maximum amount of? Oh, like macros you can have? You know, no. Okay. Nope. You can have any number. Okay. And the macros are just like six or something, right? Like, what, what are macros? Uh, they are a find and replace. So you're just saying any time the compiler sees this pattern in the code, replace it with this other thing. Uh, and it does that before then going on to compile it. So anything that starts with a pound sign in C code uh, is an instruction to the compiler preprocessor, which fills those in. So all the pound include, it will just literally copy paste the contents of whatever you file you have after pound include. It will just paste that into your file when it compiles. I think. Uh, so what does a function call involve in a C program? Um, I guess push it to the stack and change it to the RFP. Yeah. Push it to the stack and Yeah, it involves a jump to some other part of code. It involves modifying the stack. And we know interacting with memory can be slower. And we know that caching, jumping to some other part of memory, like jumping to the code some other function, that might not be in the cache. Whereas if instead of a function call, you just sort of replace something that looks like a function call with the code to do what the function call would do, that could be more efficient. Holly? I guess that was a counterpart of that question. Why don't we just do macros? Uh, because macros are harder to work with. They can be harder to reason about because it can remember it can matter exactly what is parenthesized uh, when you do this replacing, um, and so all the time we are trading off uh, performance for making software easier to write, easier to think about, easier to debug, easier to maintain. Um, so there's a good reason why you don't why functions should exist. And it's not the case that you can do literally anything a function can do using a macro. Truly a function call could be you know, quite extensive and call other functions. And um, yeah, I think that trying to use macros for everything would, would quickly become a huge pain. All right, so just some animals to start us out. Uh, not birds this time. Uh, we have uh, an armadillo here, uh, well armored, foraging for. Uh, nope, that's not what I wanted. No, nope. come back. What's oh, okay? It just closed all of them. So sad. All right, more armadillo. Uh, here's a, a feral cat with a, a very intense stare. Uh, uh, a curious squirrel poking its head out of uh, a tree, uh, and a river otter, um, which uh, might look cuddly, but these things have sharp teeth and they will bite you if you're in the water near them and they're scared of you. Um, 
And finally, a raccoon. Um, these things are not scared of you at all. Um, all right, so apart from uh, the animals, our agenda for today is to talk about uh, input output, or IO. And the general structure is uh, we're going to talk about uh, the sort of fundamental uh, on Linux, the sort of fundamental operating system functions um, that uh, kind of underlie uh, all other kind of implementations of, uh, of working with files. And, and I should say by I.O., input, output, this uh, in particular means interacting with files on the system. So reading files, writing files, creating files. However, as we'll see, what counts as a file on Linux is considerably broader than what we might think of. And after talking about Unix I.O., we'll talk about two kind of different things that are implemented on top of that. One is the set of C library functions for working with files. Uh, and then the other is a set of functions developed by uh, the authors of our textbook uh, called Rio or Robust IO functions. Um, and uh, these ones have some nice properties that are going to make them useful for our, our final lab, lab five. Um, all right, so before I talk about the specifics of these Unix IO uh, functions, uh, I want to talk about the kind of thing that they are, which is called a system call. So A system calls a function provided by the operating system. And last time, we, in the context of page faults, we talked about exceptions, where a user program is going along, something happens, it turns control over to the operating system kernel, and then, at least some of the time, can get it back and continue running. So this was the case with a page fault. A program tried to access a memory address. It was invalid for some reason. That caused the program to turn control over to this function called a page fault handler in the operating system kernel, which, if it could uh, deal with whatever issue caused the page fault, eventually sort of gave control back over to the user program. And a lot of exceptions have this structure where they're not something that the program does explicitly. Like the, pro, like the user program code didn't say, like, do a page fault here. It just did a memory access like any other, and sort of transparently in the background, this page fault occurred uh, and transfer control. A system call is a way for a program to deliberately hand control over to the operating system kernel in order to ask the kernel to do a specific thing. Kevin? Well, what's the difference between a kernel uh, most of what we're going to be talking about as the operating system is within the operating system kernel. Um, so the kernel is kind of the most significant part of the operating system. It's the part that is trusted code and kind of has the ability to do anything, uh, kind of unrestricted access to all parts of the system. Um, and uh, last time, kind of our model we had the hardware uh, of our system, and then the operating system kernel is 
the only part of the system that has permission to directly access the hardware. Which means that if my application wants to, say, read a file that is stored on disk of the hardware, it has to ask the operating system kernel to do that because these user applications don't have permission to like just go interact directly uh, with, say, the disk drive. Wait, so then, like, operating system and kernels are not separate things, right? They're, they're, they're... Uh, yeah, so you can think of the operating system kernel as kind of one, like the, the most significant thing inside the operating system as a whole. Other questions? So the system calls are functions where, uh, say, there, there's a, a system call called read. And when the user application calls read, that kind of goes narrow. <coughs> Dark disaster. All right. Well, we'll continue on somehow. Um, goes down into uh, the operating system kernel. The operating system kernel uh, knows how to kind of go talk to the hard drive uh, to actually find the file, uh, read its contents, um, and then and return control back up to the user application when that operation is finished. So that's the sort of uh, uh, function we're going to, to start with. Um, and we'll kind of build from there to kind of other functions that, that use these. Um, But before we can uh, get to exactly how these functions work, we need to talk about what actually is a file uh, on, on Linux. Uh, we can think of like the way we're going to interact with files is simply as a sequence of bytes. So uh, there's going to be byte 0, byte 1, all the way up to some byte n. And the file is just this sequence of bytes. Maybe it's text. Uh, maybe it's an executable. Maybe it's uh, an, an image file. Whatever it is, it's, it's a sequence of bytes. Um, but Files like text files, programs, images, those are not the only kinds of files. Um, on Linux, we actually have all input output devices are just represented as a file in the file system. For example, the file slash dev slash sda2 is the part uh, is represents the kind of part of the disk where kind of the user's files are stored or the file slash dev slash tty2 actually represents the terminal. So if you were to say uh, uh, send input to this file, it would show up in your terminal because the kind of input output for your terminal is just represented as this file uh, sitting in the file system. Uh, why did you have a, a question? I was going to ask like, the, the definition of like a device in this case. Um, 
This would be uh, kind of disk drives, uh, kind of things the, the user is connected to, like the terminal, uh, as we'll see, uh, sending and receiving data from the network is represented as a file. Um, so uh, kind of pretty much anything that you can uh, take input from or send output to, there's a file kind of representing that device. Um, in the system. And then this is just on Linux? Yes, this is specific to Linux. Um, and some of these things will carry over to Mac OS because that is based on Linux. Uh, Windows will likely be different. Um, even the kernel itself resides uh, at a um, Uh, the kernel itself will be some file in the in slash boot. Um, so this means that uh, the same kind of interface, this the same set of system calls that I'm talking about today, it can interact with you know text files and images and so on, like we're used to thinking about. But it can also interact with kind of all other I/O parts of the system because these are all represented as files. So it kind of Interface for working with files can apply to those as well. Okay. Yes, this is specific to Linux. Uh, Unix is a was kind of the original operating system on which Linux is based. So Linux is one of many descendants of Unix. Other questions? So it seems pretty dangerous to give any file with permissions on the system. Are these files protected by sudo, or can like literally anything in it? Uh, that's uh, a good point. So the Linux file system uh, has permissions for each file. So who is allowed to read and write and execute the file? Uh, so certainly, like. The kernel file and some of these other ones. Uh, only the kind of administrator, or as it's called on Linux, the root user, would be able to do anything with those. Um, and furthermore, because interacting with files goes via a system call, the OS kernel, aside from those permissions, could also uh, could be designed to provide other sort of protections for critical files. All right, so what are our kind of basic types of files? Uh, we have regular files. Uh, the files just containing some bytes of data could be kind of anything that we would uh, tend to think about it as a file, a text file, a program, an image, these will be regular files. A directory or a folder, also a kind of file. Uh, it's a kind of file that contains a list of other files. A directory is a container for other files. Um, and so it's kind of uh, a distinct type of file from something that includes like some data directories, a list of files, or uh, including potentially other directories that are that are contained within the file. Wait, what would what would the definition of like a, a regular file be? Uh, so I mean it's extremely broad. It's, kind of, it's a file that contains arbitrary data that is not any of these other types of files that I'll talk about. Basically, all the other types of files are kind of some specialized purpose. A regular file is we have some file that has some bytes in it. Um, could be anything. Uh, so directory. A 
directory is an index or a list of files that are within that directory. We also have a type of file called a socket. which is a file for communication. So a socket could be used to communicate to another process on the same machine or communicate, communicate across a network to uh, a process on some other machine. And so we have a type of file that's specifically for kind of sending and receiving uh, data from some other uh, endpoint. And we'll talk a lot more about sockets uh, on Friday when we talk about network programming. So you say like all the files are sequenced by itself. What would like the directory like look like in terms of the files? Uh, so uh, this kind of list of files that are within the directory, that is kind of the contents of the directory file. Uh, so the exact uh, structure of that would be determined by the file system. There is a different uh, data structures for arranging uh, files. Uh, 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 Linux, uh, there are some that tend to use Linux. Windows tends to use different ones. Um, and so, uh, but at, at some level, the directory is going to be the sequence of bytes that encode the list of files that are contained within the directory. Uh, so these are the three types of files that we're going to focus on. Uh, there are a few types that I'll just mention that are kind of beyond uh, the, the scope of this course. Uh, uh, there are files called named pipes. Uh, which are, uh, we've seen that sort of vertical character, the pipe to kind of have one uh, terminal command send its output to another. That is kind of, that's a pipe without a name. It's just kind of one, a temporary one you create uh, as part of that command. You can also create files that act as pipes to uh, shuffle data between processes. possible to have files that just point to other files. Uh, these are called links. Um, uh, and when we're talking about files that represent our terminal or a disk partition, things like that, these will be uh, their own type of files to represent a device that uh, operates on individual characters or blocks of data, character or block devices. Um, so these are files, but they're their own kind of type of file. Other questions so far? The last thing that I want to say about files in general, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, is that we can think of the arrangement of files in a file system as a tree, where there is some uh, root to the tree, some directory that within it contains all other files. Uh, on Linux, that's just slash, is the root directory. Uh, at the kind of top of this tree. And on Mantis, uh, within this root directory is a directory called accounts. And within the directory called accounts, there is a directory called awb for my home directory. And then within that, there's documents, and there's um, and then there's maybe some 
text file foo.txt. Uh, there might be Mike Ty's home directory also contained within this accounts directory. Also within uh, the root directory, there might uh, there's a directory called bin, short for binary, which within it contains the program bash, which is what your terminal is. Your terminal is just a program called bash that is running and taking input and running those commands uh, and showing the output. Um, and the main takeaway here is that we have this tree structure where there are directories that have within them other pods and directories and kind of all the way down. Uh, and we, when we write down the path of a file, we kind of just concatenate everything along the path to where we're going. So the root, slash account, slash awb, uh, slash foo.txt would be the absolute path to that file, kind of specifying the, the, the full, uh, complete path to that file. And there's also the notion of relative path, where uh, if I was, say, in this documents directory, I might say dot dot to go up one level, slash foo.txt, and this would be the relative path, which I'm saying is from It has to be relative to something. So kind of relative to this documents folder, dot dot means go kind of up one level in this tree and then foo.txt. So the directory is a giant list containing files, right? Mm -hmm. When you are creating a new file or um, creating a new directory under the, the root one, you're actually inserting an element into the list. Absolutely. That when we create a new file, we both uh, are setting aside, uh, we are like creating that file itself on the disk, setting aside space for that, giving it a name, uh, and then also creating an entry for that in whatever directory it's in. Other questions? All right, so that's our background on files. And so if we want to interact with files, uh, we have these system calls provided by uh, uh, Linux, provided by the operating system. To read and write files, there is a system called read, a system called write. To open a file, in order to be able to read or write it, we would use the uh, open system call. To close a file, tell the operating system, I'm done with this file, you can uh, free up any sort of uh, uh, data structures associated with my using that file. Do that with close. Um, and an important fact about open files is that they have a notion of the current position, that is, the particular byte you are at within the sequence of bytes that is that file. Uh, so when you open a file, it starts at the first byte, but then say you read 10 bytes from that file, now kind of your, your pointer, your place in the file is byte 11. And so if you want to change what position you are in the file, There is a system call for that called LC. All right, 
So, to look at an example of uh, working with a file. Uh, so here is a very simple program uh, where all this program does is take whatever you uh, uh, input to the program and it just prints it out. So let me walk through how uh, this works. So uh, we are we have a character where we're going to be storing the kind of one character we're reading at a time, uh, and we use read and write. And so, uh, what is what are these parameters to read? Uh, Read is going to take an integer, which is called a file descriptor. It's going to take a character pointer to uh, a buffer or uh, an array of characters, uh, or in this case, just a single character. And it also takes an unsigned integer, this size t n, uh, which is going to be the number of bytes it, you're telling it to read or write. Uh, and the write system call takes these same three parameters. So this first parameter, this file descriptor, is kind of the most mysterious of these three. Uh, and the way this works is that each running process on Linux keeps track of what files it has open and assigns each of them an integer, starting at zero and just counting up for each file it has open. And uh, Every process, when it started on Linux, begins with three files open. The file open at file descriptor 0 is standard input, like taking input from the terminal. The file that starts open at file descriptor 1 is standard output, printing things to the terminal. And there's also a file open at file descriptor 2 called standard error, uh, which also displays on the terminal, but gives you a way to separate normal output from error messages. Could you just go over again what it means for a file to be open? Uh, a file, in order to, for a process to read or write a file, it must have opened that file because uh, all our read and write operations depend on asking the operating system kernel to do that operation with the file. And in order to be able to do that, the kernel needs to have various things set up. It needs to have kind of located the file on the disk. It needs to know what position of the file we're at, um, so on and so forth. So opening the file says, like, set up everything that needs to happen in order to read and write this file. And so a process cannot interact with files uh, that it doesn't have open. Other questions? File? Um, so when it says file descriptor, it's not a descriptor of the file. It's a descriptor of um, like how that file is interfacing. 
Uh, it is a like integer identifier for that file. Um, and uh, as the, the fact that these descriptors start at zero and go up by one, as we've often seen uh, in other contexts, we're just, this file descriptor is actually just going to be used as the index into an array of open files. So it's a way to have a, a small, it's a way for a process to have a small convenient way to refer to a file that it currently has open. We just have a, an integer that we can easily pass around throughout a program which represents the file that it has open and underneath in the kernel that integer will be used as an index into an array of open files. Yes, every process when we create it has a file, an open file that reads from the terminal, an open file, and two open files that write to the terminal. And so looking at this uh, uh, C code, we can now see how we are reading from file descriptor zero, we are reading from standard in, which means this program reads characters that are typed in on the terminal, and then as it reads each one, it writes that same character to file descriptor one, which is standard output, just writes it back to the terminal. So this program just echoes exactly whatever is, is input. And read uh, returns the number of characters that were read. And so this is go this is going to continue looping while there was a character that was read. Uh, and when read returns zero, indicating nothing was read, then we exit the loop. Yep. Uh, if we're not reading from any of those indices, uh, what if we, like, say, open another file? Like, how do we know which index that is? Yes, so excellent question. Um, Open uh, takes a string, r star, that is the path, uh, as uh, we were we were talking about kind of file paths. It takes a string that's the path to the file that you want to open. Um, and let me just make sure I get this term right. Okay, so Linux calls this uh, this kind of operation flag, which if you think about opening a file in Python, we use open, we give it uh, the uh, file, uh, the file name, and then there's something else that we pass to Python's open function. Does anyone remember what that is? R or W or A. Yeah, we pass it some indication of are we opening this file for reading only? Are we opening this file for writing? Are we opening it for appending to the end of the file? And that's what this O flag uh, is. It's telling open kind of what operations we're going to be allowed to perform uh, with this file. Uh, so if I bring up a terminal that is not super tiny, and I get onto Mantis, and I bring up the manual page for open, then I can see these flags. There are different kind of access modes. Uh, that are, and these are macros, these are kind of just constants that I can use in my C code that would be kind of be filled in with the uh, appropriate integer to indicate that, that access mode. 
but there's kind of operation read only, operation write only, operation uh, read write. Um, and this uh, open returns an integer, which is the file descriptor that uh, uh, the file has been, been opened with. And kind of that's the file descriptor that you would then pass to read or write uh, to interact with that file. And the um, Open will use the next available file descriptor, which, as long as uh, the process still has its three initial files open, and the, the first file it opens will use file descriptor three. And it just uses kind of whatever descriptor is is next available. Questions on this? Yes, in the case of read, uh, we're saying here is the memory address where you should put the characters that are read, whereas write, you're giving it the memory address where it should take characters from to write to the, the destination. So what would happen if you were to write to, the standard in? Uh, my guess is that that would fail, and write would return a negative one to indicate an error, and just nothing would happen. Um, uh, although, the other possibility, I need to test this, is that uh, you'd, write the, you'd write some characters to here, and those would be the next ones you would read uh, from standard in. And they would just be, they would kind of end up stored in some temporary array. Uh, associated with that file, but I need to I need to test it to see exactly what we have. Other questions? Does it also return that the number of characters written? Right? Yes, exactly. All right. So. Uh, before I go any further, I would like to tell you about the uh, first uh, U.S. president to travel outside to to travel outside the Americas while president, um, and that was uh, Woodrow Wilson in uh, 1919. World War One was over, uh, and there was, as far as I know, the only. Uh, 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 event uh, uh, like this of its kind, um, there were going to be negotiations over the treaty that was going to end the war, how a disputed territory was going to be resolved, uh, and the leaders of governments from all over the world came to Paris for something like seven months. So in some sense, uh, the, uh, the, the governments of many countries of the world temporarily relocated to Paris as uh, they negotiated this treaty, and uh, a lot of these negotiations were uh, these four guys and their staff in a room, uh, these guys being um, uh, uh, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd George here, Prime Minister of the UK, um, uh, Vicente Orlando uh, uh, of Italy, uh, George Clemenceau of France, and Woodrow Wilson uh, from the US. And uh, this was a kind of unusual move uh, by uh, Wilson, kind of leaving the U.S., going across the Atlantic, and just personally negotiating uh, this treaty. Uh, and uh, Wilson had uh, kind of uh, around the time of America's entry into World War I put forth these 14 points, uh, kind of his vision for how the world should be organized after the war. 
Um, and a major one of these points was uh, the formation of something called the League of Nations, an inter international organization that would kind of keep the peace, enforce international law. And so he was there in Paris trying to, trying to get this to happen. Um, of course, there were countries involved in the war besides uh, uh, the UK, uh, France, Italy, and the US. Germany uh, was uh, heavily involved, um, but Germany was not part of the treaty negotiations at all. Uh, once the treaty was drawn up, uh, the uh, victorious countries brought the German representatives into this Hall of Mirrors, where, in fact, France had been forced to sign a treaty with Germany in a war in, eight, in the 1870s. France brought them in, made them sign this, this treaty. Uh, this treaty took... Uh, uh, various parts of Germany uh, to uh, Lithuania or Poland or the newly formed Czechoslovakia uh, to France, Belgium, Denmark. Um, it also uh, forced Germany to pay, uh, to basically pay the war debts of the winning countries, um, uh, which was an enormous sum. Uh, and this basically happened by the U.S. loaning money to the Germans to pay uh, to Britain and France, who then used that money to pay back the loans that U.S. bankers had given them during the war. Um, this whole system was very stable and nothing ever went wrong. Um, and in general, the borders across Europe uh, were redrawn. Many new countries, um, uh, in addition to Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, uh, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Finland, uh, all, uh, as well as uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, ceased to exist, forming Turkey and uh, parts of the Middle East that were at that time controlled by Britain and France. And the League of Nations did indeed form, um, but Wilson uh, uh, made a uh, singular error of uh, not um, considering that there were an, a lot of people in the U.S. who were opposed to being part of the League of Nations, particularly the Republican Party at that time. So the U.S. never joined the League of Nations, never ratified that treaty. Um, so uh, Wilson's, Wilson's dream existed without the participation of the U.S. Um, here's a, a political cartoon of the, the time. There are these uh, various isolationist senators, Senator Bora, Lodge, Johnson, who are refusing to give Lady Peace a seat on the subway. Um, League of Nations uh, ceased to exist after World War II in 1946 and was replaced with the United Nations, which uh, includes uh, almost, almost every country on the globe. All right, that's our history. So let's do a little practice. Okay, so I have this function here uh, calls open um, uh, and close and then open again. Uh, and this uh, third parameter is uh, relevant when you are using open to create a new file. So we're not creating a new file here, so it's just zero. Uh, so I'd like you to take a moment and think about uh, what's going to be printed uh, and we print FD2. All right, some votes for all of the options. So please discuss with your neighbors what FD1 and FD2 are and why you think they uh, FD2 would have the value you chose. Okay, a little slow. Uh, I think there's been some movement toward three, that is uh, excellent. That is what uh, what FD2 will be. Uh, can someone uh, share how you thought about this one? You should. So we impose uh, FD1, which means close the first file that should open. Uh, the number three file descriptor is deallocated and ready to be used. So when you open up another file, you'll get some. Exactly, that we have file descriptors starting at zero, zero, one, and two are open when we start the program, then we'll open a file and get three, but when we close that, 
that file descriptor is made available for some future file. Rebecca? Yeah, if you were to print FD1 instead, would it still like print 3, but you just like wouldn't be able to do anything with it? Uh, you mean like print it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So FD1 and FD2 are both 3. Mm -hmm. um, and before we close FD1, reading or writing to file descriptor 3, uh, we can all, it's read only. So reading from file descriptor 3 would read characters from foo.txt. Once we open open the second time, reading or writing from file descriptor 3 would interact with baz.txt. So uh, after we close FD1, we have no way to interact with, to read foo.txt anymore, and then it gets replaced with uh, baz.txt. Uh, Cecilia? Are file descriptors like within the context of each program, the way like virtual memory addresses are or something? Yes, each process has its own array of file descriptors. Um, yeah, and so multiple different processes could have the same file open, and uh, and we'll shortly like see a diagram of kind of what the different parts of this are sort of uh, in the in the kernel. Yeah. So like in, in this case, every two being set to three, it's, it's not like it's not like the number three. It's just like a. Uh, it is the integer three. Okay, so it's an integer three, but then so so then how do we like read stuff from math up to speed? Like where 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 are the bytes from math up to speed? Uh, they're presumably on the 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 hard drive, the disk, um, and we would read from them by uh, using the read system call, and we'd say read from file descriptor three. Uh, here's a memory address where you should put the characters that you read. And then here is the number of characters to read. Wow. Does, uh, does close return anything? Uh, yes. All system, uh, so close uh, returns, um, uh, let's see, because I know it returns negative 1 if there is an error, which is the most important point. Okay, it just returns zero if it successfully closed, or negative one uh, if there was a problem trying to close. And in general, all these system calls return negative one to indicate that there was some sort of error. So it's always a good idea, just like with malloc, to check if it returns null in case the allocation failed. Always check the return values of system calls to see if they're negative one, indicating an error. Crystal. So for every file you open, you have to like close the Or you can just like keep the file and like open it. Uh, so normally uh, processes have a limit to how many files they're allowed to have open at any one time. Um, so uh, in that sense, if you are going to need to open a lot of files, you should close the ones that you're finished with. Uh, also, in terms of how much memory your program is using, each file that you have open. There's kind of data structures that have to be kept in memory uh, for open files. So you should close files when you're done with them so that that memory can be deallocated. Um, however, when your program exits, all of those structures are deallocated. Uh, so uh, closing files, always closing files is good style. Um, but in terms of practical performance, it's going to matter if your program is like running for a long time. If it's really short, then it doesn't really matter if you close uh, because they're going to be closed for you when the program exits. Does that make sense? Yeah. You hear me? No, that wasn't a question. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Other questions? All right. Here's another piece of code. So uh, we have open and read, uh, which we've talked about. Uh, we also have this function dupe2, which just causes uh, the uh, second file descriptor to refer to the same file that the first descriptor does. So, in, uh, so when we have used output redirection, so done something like... Uh,
I have cat foo arrow my file in the terminal to take the output of this file and send it to here. That is saying, all right, make standard out for the purpose of this command instead of file descriptor one referring to standard out, make file descriptor one refer to my file. And so this dupe to function is a way to do that, to say, take this file descriptor and just make it refer to the same file as this other file descriptor. And uh, the arguments are the old file descriptor is first and uh, the new file descriptor is second. So it makes the new file descriptor refer to the same file as the old file descriptor. Uh, what happens if that that new file descriptor was initially pointing to a file that hasn't been closed? Uh, well, that's typically what we will want, uh, because if the old file descriptor was referring to a file that's been closed, then we can't do anything with that file. So the purpose of this is to be able to use to whatever happens to new file descriptor and old file descriptor, they're now just referring to the same, presumably open file. But then how do we, um, does that automatically close the, I guess I'm, I'm confused. Yeah, so let's look at a diagram of this. So our process will have a file descriptor table, which I mentioned is just going to be an array of open files. And so 0 is standard in. One is standard out, two is standard error, and then the rest can uh, uh, don't start out open. And so, uh, say standard out, this entry in this table is going to point to a uh, kind of a we can think of this as a, as a struct, keeping track of data for this open file. Um, this would have things such as the position that the file is currently at, and a count of how many uh, things currently refer to this open file, kind of a, a count of how many references there are to it. Um, and this uh, entries in this open file table will refer to um, uh, structures sort of other kind of data about the file, like its size and its type. So if we uh, had a situation where we had kind of file descriptor one was referring to this file, file descriptor three referring to this file, um, this uh, dupe two is a way of saying uh, make some file descriptor refer to the same file uh, as some other one. But then what would happen to STDL? Uh, so um, this, uh, as part of this, uh, the kernel would know that this reference to this file was being changed, so it would decrement the reference count, and when that gets to zero, the kernel knows, okay, nothing is referring to this file and can be freed. Um, yeah, I mean, garbage collection specific to these file structs, so not sort of in general, but yeah, keeping track of the references and, and freeing when they get to zero, which is why not closing a file you're done with will keep the structure around because it will the operating system will see that there's still some process that's referring to it. Houston? Um, so if I'm 
why, why would you want to have two uh, descriptive portraits? Um, in order to make something like output redirection work. That if we want to be able to take what this would send, what this will send the standard out, and instead of having it appear in the terminal, have it go to this file, we, we might want to do something exactly like this, where like all the printf's still going to write the output to standard out, but now instead of going to this file, which actually puts things in the terminal, it goes to this other file, which is you know, some file called Y. Other questions? All right, so back to this problem. We open three files. We call dupe2 uh, to make fd3 refer to the same file as fd2, and then we read one character from each of these file descriptors. Um, and the scenario is foo.txt contains five characters, a, b, c, d, e. And given that information, I am asking what is going to be printed out, c1, c2, c3, which are uh, the characters that these read calls will store the characters that they read. They're going to put them in c1, c2, or, or c3. Uh, mainly thinking A or C, so please discuss with your neighbors why you chose the answer you did. All right, uh, positive movement toward A, that's excellent, that's uh, what, we'll, what we'll get here. Um, and uh, someone uh, Share how you how you thought about this, or or questions you have about how this is working. Oh, sorry. When you call um the so calling open on the file multiple times is like making multiple instances of that file for the process. So it has like the three like separate instances of the file that. It, the process has open, and then you do uh, fd2 and fd3. So now they're both referring to one of those instances. So calling then calling the read on each um, descriptor is reading the character from the first instance. Then it reads the second read is reading from the second instance, and the third read is also reading from that instance. So the um, What's it? The position is incremented for the second instance. That's exactly exactly it. That uh, this is a, a situation where we have something like this picture, where we have different file descriptors, uh, like FD1 and then FD2 and uh, uh, like just FD1 and FD2. Uh, we've opened the same file twice, and we're going to kind of have one of these. We're going to keep track of some of the position where we are in that kind of open instance of the file. As opposed to the same, we're going to keep track of each of those distinctly, uh, but underneath they all refer to the, the same file, the same bytes on the disk. Um, and when we read from a file, this position is kind of incremented, and we pick up reading where we left off. So see. Why we're passing in a term? Like, what, what is the, like, what are the characters for? Uh, the characters are here is the address where you should write the bytes that are read from the file. So, uh, yeah, so it's put the one character you read here or there or there. Um, when we're writing, you also give it a char star, which is here are the bytes you should write to whatever file you're writing to. Uh, all right, we are out of time, uh, but if you're uh, happy to stick around if there are more questions, uh, remember to make the, the check-in post. Uh, we'll continue with file stuff and start our networking on Friday. I have office hours starting in a bit.